Uh, the Southwest Roots, I know they're they stay. Uh, they usually angle toward Kathy anyway, so you your sights. So maybe they look at you like a bird. You gotta get through. Yeah, I do. See, see what I'm getting at. Just don't you. Alright, well, um, all, all good things and all other things come to an end. And so, whichever one of this is, this is our last class of the quarter. Um, got a couple of these left. Uh, anybody just walk in and need a sheet for tonight? Want a sheet? All right. I think, Jeremy, I'm going to meet you or give it to you. If you can. Just if anybody comes in the back. I'll wait just a little bit. Come on in. We're, we're not started yet. Oh, the finger. Oh. Oh, um, I, I, I hit the wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> it was only 30 degrees outside when I did it. So. And it was only like the first nail I, I drove. So that made it hurt that much more. I didn't, well, that way the feeling was all gone. So oh, okay. it was good. What did you say? Yeah. I just had to say that so you didn't think I was banking my fingernails or something. So uh, I think we got, we kind of settled in here. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our great God in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of opening up your word. God, we don't want to take that for granted. We know that there was a time in which it was very difficult for people to have access to the Bible. That there have been times when people have been persecuted because of their attempt to study and follow your word. We live in a time in which we have free access like never before. And we're grateful that we have good minds that we can uh, open up your word and, and look into it and study it and, and come to know you and to know it better. And as we do read in your word, Father, we come to understand who you are and it makes us love you more and want to serve you better. In every aspect of our lives that you've given us the opportunity. God, as we think about what your word has to say on the subject of marriage and, and who we can be as people in those marriages, we pray that we'll pursue that with our whole heart fervently. Help us to encourage each other. We're so grateful for group Bible study that allows us to uh, draw off each other's knowledge and, and to learn it in this environment together. And we pray that we will always be seeking your will in our marriages, that we can have marriages that continue to be built up and to look more like what we see in Ephesians 5 between Christ and the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so often in describing happy couples, uh, people talk about a marriage or a match made where? In heaven. In heaven. You know, when the world uses that phrase, it, it kind of has in mind some perfect combination of two people or two things, right? Things that just seem to go together, like peanut butter and jelly, or watermelon and salt, um, or salt and pepper. Chicken and dumplings, or peanut butter and syrup, or peanut butter and bananas, peanut butter really in anything, you know, it's, it, it goes together. But you know, our world also believes in fate and destiny, that certain circumstances throw two people together who were made for each other. Now, we believe in God's providence, don't we? What, how would you describe to somebody what God's providence is? We talk about it all the time. God has a plan. Okay. How does he work that plan out? I mean, he has a plan that's revealed in his word, right? And that pattern uh, shows us what he had planned from the beginning for the church, what he had uh, planned in, uh, in the beginning for salvation. Um, and, and providence is revealed to us in the word that gives us that plan. But providence is even something a little different from uh, the revealed will of what God has uh, stating that he's going to do and, and establishing the church and so forth. Do you have providence in your life? How do you know it is or, or is it what is providence? 
I've heard it defined this way. Maybe I think at some point I'm going to preach a sermon soon on, on the, the providence of God. It's God working behind the scenes. It's God working through time and events in our lives, right? And, and I think we, we, we approach this with humility because I don't know that we can know in a specific circumstance at the time that a thing is or is not providence. Um, we can have a pretty good idea that something is according to God's will. But a lot of times we get a better benefit of that when we look in the hindsight, right? We look back and we can see a series of things that have happened or occurred to get us to the present hour, and we can see that it's going in God's direction. It's, it's in accordance with His will that He's working that out. So through time and events. Now, uh, again, I, I, I feel pretty certain at this point, uh, in two months, Kathy and I will have been married 29 years. That there, there may have been some providence involved in our meeting one another. I was going to go to Freed Harbor University. I had that planned for a long time, uh, and my dad said he would give me some uh, assistance as long as it was at a Christian college. Um, but it turned out, and it's not because I'm smart, there was a guy who was recruiting at Faulkner University, and he only recruited one student in, in, in all of his history as a recruiter or counselor at uh, Faulkner, and it was me. I got a, a full tuition scholarship because I was a Bible major. Well, that's still the deal, so I went to, to Faulkner. Well, Kathy, two years, uh, uh, however younger than she is, than she is than me, she, at, when it came time for her to go to school, she um, she was going to go to Freed Hardman too. Never heard of Faulkner. Only lived about two hours from campus, but a, a singing group came up there and a youth rally or something, found out about it, and she decided, well, um, she can tell you the story better than I can. She made the decision anyway to go to Fault University. And she walked on, on campus. There's a whole lot longer story I'm not going to bore you with now uh, about how we, we came to know each other. But I had been going to other churches, but I decided on that Wednesday night I was going to go to the singing. Check out the new the uh, new students that had come in. And uh, I was not attached at the time. And, and uh, I happened to, to go in the auditorium. I happened to sit, I happened to be at church. And so was she, and classes hadn't even started, and uh, that was a night in which I had to repent because I didn't worship very much. I was looking at her every chance I had, and it turned out she was looking at me every once in a while, too. Providence seemed to be at play in bringing us into that same place at that same time. And that, uh, I, tell you, I know this is going to embarrass you, but not like I haven't already. But uh, that Wednesday night after church, I decided I wanted to meet her. But I had never gone up to a girl and, and introduced myself. I was I was a little shy in that regard. And a buddy of mine who had just broken up with a girl was walking with me. And uh, she was sitting at the table. We were having an ice cream fellowship after after church. And there was one guy sitting across from her, and there was another guy on his knee who was serenading her. And another guy who had already asked her out, and I went up there, and it so happened. First of all, the guy the guy was with said, if you don't talk to her, I'm going to. And, and I knew he would, so I sorry. So I went up to her. I'm getting the providence part right now. So I went up to her, and I started talking to her, and found out. I lived in a little tiny place called Blairsville, Georgia at the time. And I started talking to her, and apparently her dad had used to be the preacher in little tiny Blairsville, Georgia. And from there, a, a conversation started, and um, there were I think she had four dates that weekend, but I was number one. So uh, number first in order, not the number one. And uh, fortunately, I was first, and that was it. So, you know, Providence was at, at play, perhaps, it seems, looking back on that. Kathy might have thought so until tonight, so I'm going to stop talking about Kathy. Um, when we talk about God's providence, we're talking about the idea that as we pray and seek, God provides and helps us to find it. you believe that? If we are looking in a certain direction, you know, if, if we're looking in the, the way that God wants us to look, and we avoid looking for the one that we shouldn't be looking for. So like you remember Solomon in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, he's talking about the, the, the person that his son should not pursue. And as Solomon's son listened to that, he was going to avoid the one that was not going to be good for him. And he would have his eyes on one that would be in line with what it is that he needed to be looking for. And I believe very much in Proverbs 16 and verse 3, 
where Scripture says, commit your work or your thoughts to the Lord and all your plans will be established. If your general outlook in life is that I am going to commit everything that I am to what God wants me to do, I'm going to put him first in my life. That doesn't mean I'm going to necessarily be the most prosperous, the most successful, the most problem-free, but it means that all my plans, because my plans will be shaped the right way, are going to be established. God's going to open up doors because God will know we're going to try to, to use that door, that entryway, to serve him. But many times in the past and present, there have been situations where men and women have grown up in a culture where arranged marriages take place. They don't have a choice. I've been to three or four countries where the, the bride and groom's family have arranged it ever since they were little. And I knew them as married people who've gone through that uh, situation. That's just the way the culture is. They're, they don't know to think, wow, I can't go out and pick my own person for myself. They just, they just do that. And they live happy, strong, fruitful, and fulfilling marriages and lives. I have known situations, you probably have too, where uh, a husband and wife have been married and one of them loses their spouse, but they've had a strong and healthy marriage. And then that widow or widower gets married again to somebody completely different. And they have a strong and healthy and fruitful marriage again. And yet there have been some circumstances, haven't there, when there have been two people who have grown up in the same culture and with the same interests and with the same background and, and the same uh, direction and tastes in life and they have struggled to make it work. And so when we, we think about what it takes for us to succeed in our, our marriages, if you're married, and I would guess, I don't know that I'm, I'm not inspecting you, but I think just about everybody here, if, if not, most of you are married. And if you're married, it's a moot point anyway. However wise or foolish you think that you were in your choice, however planned or impulsive it all was, it's, it's the fact that you're together now. And here's what Peter says about you if you are together. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, You are heirs together of the grace of life. What does that mean? That you are heirs together of the grace of life. Joint heirs of the kingdom. Okay, so joint heirs of the kingdom, and that's exactly right. What does that What does that mean to us? Brothers and sisters sharing uh, salvation. All right, your brothers and sisters who stand and inherit eternal salvation. And he puts you together in that passage. He says, "I want you to see yourself not only as an individual who's trying to go to heaven." But you are in a relationship, you're in a circumstance where you are, are trying to walk along with somebody else and help that other person in your life, that special spouse, that mate, that compliment, that helpmate. You're trying to help them also stand before the king on his right hand at the last day and hear him say, well done. It, it, you have the same opportunity, the same hope of heaven. And the context of 1 Peter chapter 3, by the way, suggests that each of you helps the other realize that opportunity and hope, or you can hinder it. I don't know how many classes on marriage have looked at the example of Aquila and Priscilla, but I feel like this is a, a way for us to end this class. We've been talking about how can I build up my marriage, and we've looked at several different ways, and may I suggest tonight that you be heaven-hearted. And I want to point out to you in your notes, if you'd like to have it, that there are five passages alone where we see a bullet Priscilla presented to us in Scripture. Acts chapter 18 and verse 2. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. Romans chapter 16 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 19. As far as I know, I may have missed something, but I think that's the only places in Scripture where they appear. But even in those few passages, there are some very interesting things to learn, some facts about living together, at least as we see this particular husband and wife. First of all, they had been through trials together. They were forced by their government to leave their house in Rome simply because they were Jews. Claudius, the king, had made a decree, and since they were Jews, they had to leave. The second thing that we learn is that they had worked together in the same profession. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 3, what was their job? Anybody know? 
They were tent makers. All right, so they, they worked together. How many of you, husbands and wives, either now or in the past have worked together, have done a job together? Not very many hands went up, but there were uh, a few. And hey, retire, hey, Roger, retirement counts. If you're retired she together. For me and she oh, she forgot? <laughs> yeah, that's a different class. I wish I had one more week. We could deal with that. So it's, um, I would say it's a challenge, isn't it, on some level, uh, if you're together all the time. But it also can build compatibility. It certainly produces time for you to be together. It's memorable. So you have all of that going for you, right? Uh, third, they were fellow workers in soul winning. They were able and willing, and they were a great team. Fourth, they were of one mind in suffering for Christ. The way Paul puts it was they risked their neck for their, the brotherhood, Romans 16 and verse 4. And they had a united philosophy about hospitality and service. They opened up their church to the home in Romans chapter 6, uh, rather 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9. But the thing I want you to notice is that every time that we read about them, whether it's at home or in the church, with the saints or with the world, they are always together. That's a beautiful thing to see, that they were teammates in work and in life. You know, marriage is being assaulted like it never has been before. There's a, there are forces out there that are trying to redefine what marriage is and who uh, can be married. And there's a powerful attempt to pull husbands and wives apart. And those storms that are going to come into our lives can only be weathered by the resilience and the resolve of both partners seeing that they're heirs together of the grace of life. So what I want to do in the few minutes that we have is to examine Aquila and Priscilla together. And as we see that, I, I think I should be caught up now. Number one, we see that Aquila and Priscilla were together in problems. There is no doubt but that marriages are going to encounter problems at every stage of the way. They're going to be different in all the different stages. You've been married for a while. You already know some of the stages. There are stages yet to come. I suppose all the way up to the end of life stage, there are struggles and problems that, that husbands and wives go through. Financial hardship. Troubles with cars and with houses. Health concerns. Extended family issues. Temptation. Discouragement. Depression. Depression. In fact, you can probably take a snapshot of the last 12 to 18 months, and you have dealt with some of these. There are going to be times probably when over that span of time, you will deal with all of these. Nobody is immune from difficulties. I think about what Job said in Job 14 and verse 1, and he was going through so much more than the average couple will ever go through, but he was right when he said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job 14 and verse 1. Aquila and Priscilla. What, what, what kind of problems did they face? What, what did they encounter that was so difficult for them? They got displaced there. Kicked out of Rome. All right, so they, so, and, and they were displaced on the basis of what? Faith. All right, faith. Although by the time that they're in Acts chapter 18, their, their faith is secondary as the reason why they're kicked out. They're Jews. And what's wrong? Gen, they're Gentile people, right? They're uh, they're, they're Latin, not Latin like Latino. They're European uh, uh, extraction, and so they're ethnically different. Now, most of us, maybe all of us, have never have been seriously or adversely affected by that. Um, but the government made them leave their house because of the color of their skin. And I want you to notice that they endured this together apparently without it forming a wedge between them. You know, sometimes it's interesting, isn't it, when we have problems, we may not be the problem. It may be an external thing. But the pressure of that external thing can sometimes form a wedge between us, can it? Even though it's not something that's going on between us, just the sheer weight of it or, or the concern that we feel or the way that we react to that can make us react against one another. But as Christian families in the lost world, it may not be our skin color, but it may be our values that are in the minority, and the pressure that we feel to conform can be enormous. You know, I read recently uh, the biography of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and maybe you already know this uh, about him. He died really young. He was only 36 years old when he died. He had all kinds of mental problems. 
He was a moral mess. He was a relational mess. And when he died on that rainy morning of his 30, in his 36th year, they buried him in a pauper's grave. He was absolutely poor. Now, of all the problems he had, there was one thing that he had about him that I think we could say was admirable. And one of the reasons why he died so poorly was the philosophy that he commonly shared. He said, I will not write what they will buy. I will write what I hear. Now, I think when it comes to Christian living, will we neglect what we hear in God's word and say only what we think the world wants to buy? Well, here you have Aquila and Priscilla in the face of that, uh, showing us how husbands and wives need to be united in a submissive spirit to what God's word has to say. We need each other to hold each other accountable for holding forth the word of life and not the word of lies, Philippians 2.17. And so we must be united when problems come. And remember what Peter said to those husbands and wives in 1 Peter 3, 7. He said, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now I think about Peter writing this. He must have been a pretty good success at it, right? Peter says, husbands, make sure you understand who you're living with. She's not like you. She's different from you. She's a woman. She is... In the, at least in the physical sense of that, and in some degree in the emotional sense, she is the, the weaker vessel. But your heirs together the grace of life. Now, Peter, we, we think about Peter, the disciple, and how impetuous he was, how he jumped out in the water, how he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. But Peter was also a husband. And how do we know that Peter was pretty good at what he's telling us in 1 Peter 3 7? What else was he besides preaching? Yeah, he's an elder. And how do we know he was good at this? Because there are qualifications for a man who is an elder with regard to his wife and with regard to his family. And so Peter was living this out. He was handling and managing difficulty in a way that he would show others to do that. I like what a man named Leighton says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7. He says, if your love is built on the foundation of love and beauty, when that fades, so too can the relationship. But a relationship that is built on the mind and the personality, those things are also subject to change. But a relationship that is built upon the foundation of Christ is the relationship that Peter has in mind. And he says, um, you avoid that bitterness, that so little true sweetness in the life of most married persons because God is left out because they do not meet his warning in him. I suggest to you that your marriage will be ironclad when you turn to each other and not on each other when trouble comes. Aquila and Priscilla were together in times of problems. Number two, they were together in times of evangelism. If y'all can stomach it one more time, let me let me mention my wife. God has blessed me in an enormous way. She is my superior when it comes to soul. She has the demeanor, she has the manner, and I think she has the effectiveness in the, in the, the track record of our relationship. Um, she, she certainly holds her own in that regard. When I think of Will and Priscilla, it is perhaps the soul winning side of them that stands out the most in what all the Bible says about them. When I look at their life together, the interesting thing, do you notice this? What do we know about the soul winning of Aquila? You're exactly right. Everybody has the right answer. We don't know anything of his because we never see him doing evangelism by himself. We see them together. And you have an interesting incident. It's in Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28, where you have this man by the name of Apollos. And you'll see them come together and they work with him. And there's some beautiful um, incidents involved in this episode that I think are, are noteworthy for us. If you go to Acts chapter 18 and verse 24, in fact, if somebody will very quickly read Acts 18, uh, 24 through 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was spoken and taught accurately, the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. 
So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews and publicly showed from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Okay. I see at least four elements in their evangelism that made them successful. And they did it together. What do you see? What did they do that made them so successful in working with this man who needed to be taught the way of truth more perfectly? Knew the scriptures. Say it again? Knew the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. All right. Where do you see that, Rick? Uh, right there in uh, verse 24. All right. It says that Aquila and Priscilla knew the scriptures. Well, it says eloquent, man, and mighty. That's oh, Apollos. Okay, wait a minute. You're fine. I think you made the right point. We just got to get the right verse. Yeah, right verse. Verse 28. Okay. Yeah. What does it say, Derek? Um, three. Okay, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Is that a quote from Silver? Well, no, that's, a, that's Paul's six. again. Explain <laughs> the way of All right, there we go. There we go. There it is. I need We're like one. a bee. We're going all around that flower. We're going to hit it. There you go. All right, they knew the scriptures. What else? We'll talk more about this in just a minute. Instead of publicly saying something to him, they pulled him to the side. Discretion. Okay, very good. What what verse is that? It's going to be 26. Okay. What else do you see? We'll let the scriptures talk. We'll let the scriptures talk. All right. Not what they said wasn't there. Okay. They were encouraged. Okay. How do you see that they were encouraged? Verse 27, it talks about how he wanted to go to Achaia, so the brethren encouraged him. I assume that they would be included in that. Okay. It also alludes to that when it says that they explain to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, it wasn't just a it wasn't just criticism, it was constructive Good. in nature. Good. I think that is a or good at least it sound that way. Yep. What else? Did you see anything else? The fact that they just said something yeah. as opposed to just talking about it and what verse does it say? Is that, is that also 26? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else you noticed? Okay, so what would you deduce from that? Is that speak to what you were saying? Wherever they, wherever they went, they took advantage of the opportunity. Was that what you were emphasizing, or what verse was that? Um, All right. Okay, that's actually a lot better list than I have. I see that's why I do this is so you know if I ever teach this again, I'll have a lot better notes than I had this time. But let me add a couple of things. First of all, listening was a key element to their evangelism. You see that in verse 26? They heard him. I want you to notice that this preceded their teaching him. And we're talking about this on Sunday morning in our evangelism class. So often we want to download. We want to tell people what, what we know. We want to monopolize talking because we you know we're the teacher after all. And that's that's backwards. What we always want to ever get and, and those of you who are who have a business where you've got to build business by building client and customer base and all that you understand this right and how important it is the better you can listen and know what somebody needs what somebody is after what their problem is whatever it is you you learn a whole lot more and it makes it you more effective in helping them with whatever it is that they actually need they may say they think they need something you listen to them and you can point them in a different direction 
Here's Apollos. He stands up. He actually is teaching. He's teaching, not teaching the, the full truth. And they hear him. Our job is to be keen listeners. And, you know, a lot of times if you're together husband and wife, you might can help each other and encourage each other. I would encourage you if you're trying to sit down with somebody that you have already pre, you know, you guys ever played baseball and, you know, signals and so forth. It may be, it may be good for you to have some of that with, uh, with your spouse, right? Like, you know, you're talking too much once you listen a little bit. We can help each other, right? The second thing was tact, and I think you picked up on that. They pulled him aside. There was discretion. Um, they didn't publicly rebuke him. They didn't even, uh, in an ugly way, confront him. And that gets to the encouraging that Bailey and, and Derek were talking about. Third, clear communication was a key element of their evangelism. They explained to him the way of God more accurately. We have got to avoid presumptions and assumptions with people that we teach. We may think we know where they are. We may uh, assume some things that we don't need to. We may assume they know things that they don't know. So that communication. And here's another thing. When you look at somebody who is not in the right relationship with God, you need to have vision. I think that's also implied from this context. First of all, they'd already gotten a sample of what he was like and what he could do. And then after they teach him, they help him. And what does he go on to do? They encourage him after the fact, verse 27, they could see the potential in him. That can be very hard for us, especially if somebody's still got their rough edges up and, and they're, they're still carrying their sinful baggage and they still have their worldliness about them. And we we got to be able to look past that because I think of Jesus with the 12 apostles. How did he go about that? How did he pick up Peter, James, and John, and all of these different guys? He could look past the veneer, the surface, to see what was underneath. And, and I believe that as we look at anybody that we encounter, some folks it's harder than for other folks. We need to be able to see beneath the, the difficult exterior of what they could be and what Christ can make them to be. So we see Aquila, and that's the point of this. I'm not trying to teach evangelism. I know that's Sunday morning. Um, but they were together in this evangelism. But here's the thing. Just taking those four qualities, you can take these uh, the, the same. I wonder if they applied these to their marriage. Let me challenge you. Are you growing in your Bible knowledge? Husband and wife. Do you know more today than you knew this time last year? Do you have a program or system in place to help you to really know God's word better all the time? Think about how that it will not only benefit you, but it will benefit your marriage. The better you know scripture, the better equipped you're going to be for every relationship in life. How about this one? And maybe it can be more passive aggressive, right? If your spouse does something you disapprove of, especially if you're in a group setting, the best thing you can do is go up to him or her and humiliate them in public. <laughs> they will love you for that. They'll not resent you at all. There'll be no bitterness. And they'll just, they'll just thank you. Because that's how we feel, right? How much better, especially if it's an open opportunity, that we don't take advantage of it, but we instead wait until there's a more discreet moment to take care of it. How about encouraging? And we can be the best encouragers of everybody else in our lives. How much encouraging do we do of our spouse? How about the courage to kindly correct and direct them? How about making why using our opportunities wisely and taking advantage of situations that need to be talked about. How about listening? How about tact? How about clear communication? How about having vision? Do you see your spouse for what they could be as you try to influence them? The improvements that, that can happen. I don't mean change them, manipulate them, and try to uh, mold them into what you want them to be, but can you see what they can be? Now, the reason I say all this is because when you stand before the Lord in the judgment day, there are going to be some people who's going to make you less accountable for their soul. There are going to be folks you never met. There are going to be folks that you never had any contact with that you really had no opportunity with. He's not going to make you accountable for them. But there's one person that I know that you're going to stand and give an account for on the judgment day, besides yourself. And that's the influence that you had on your spouse. So you have a great soul winning opportunity, not only close to home, but in the home. And the principles that worked 
with them, with Apollos, is our principles they needed with one another. More to say about that, but let me move on to number three. They were together in sacrifice. I know it's hard for us to quantify sacrifice in a first world situation where really we've got a comfortable standard of living. We're not being actively persecuted by our government at present. It seems like that feels like it's encroaching all the time. But at present, it doesn't feel like it's that way at all. So how does sacrifice come? And really, I, I think it's remarkable that the Bible doesn't tell us specifically how Aquila and Priscilla risked their necks for the brotherhood. We know they sacrificed and they had to give up their home and go somewhere else. They apparently had some uh, continuing wealth because everywhere we read about them, the church is meeting in their home. In Romans 16, where the church is meeting in their home seems to happen after Acts chapter 18 when they're pushed by Claudius out of their home in Rome. So they, they, they were better off than most of their peers in the church, it appears to be. But they had risked their neck for Paul. They had seen Paul in danger, hadn't they? They could have risked their neck for him in one of several situations. Incidental, if you want this, this fact, Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul on the second and the third missionary journeys. You just follow Luke's record in Acts, starting in Acts chapter 18. They witnessed the mob uh, scene in Corinth when Paul is drugged before Gallio in his judgment seat. And that was a pretty scary scene. Aquila and Priscilla are there. In the next chapter, they were in Ephesus when, you remember Demetrius, the, 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 uh, the idols are burned and destroyed and they burn their books because they're convicted by the message and all the local merchants are upset by that. And so Demetrius uh, stirs up the violence that threatens Paul's life. Maybe it was on one of those occasions. But the fact was that all the Gentiles gave thanks for their sacrifice shows that the incident was widely known. The brotherhood knew about that. So here's the question. What will you be called on to sacrifice for Christ as husbands and wives? It may be personal comfort. It may be time. It may be financial security. It may be certain friendships and relationships that are harmful to your faith and your influence. It may even be physical safety. It may be dignity. It may be any number of things. But in so many cases, the sacrifice that you make will be made known to others. You don't have to blow the trumpet. You don't have to say, oh, look how much I've suffered for the cause of Christ. It's just the way it is that if you faithfully serve Christ and it cost you something, folks will find out about that. And I think about the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 1, and verse 12, he says, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the entire Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now, he's an inspired writer. He's not saying, uh, just in case you hadn't heard Philippi, I want you to know all this stuff I've suffered for the Lord. He's saying, this is already known. There, the guards where I'm in prison already know about what I've given up, my, my freedom and my, and my safety. And if you think about that, some of Caesar's household is converted. So it has gone widely and far. And so his sacrifice was known. When your mindset is to present yourself a living sacrifice, you become living proof of, of that fact. Number four, uh, number five, four, five, four. They were together in hospitality. They opened their home to the church that met in their home. You know, the entertaining room in a moderately well-to-do house could hold about 30 people comfortably. I believe that the folks in Romans chapter 16 are the folks that met in their home in the church. And if so, it seems that they might have been very well off. And they were generous with the things that God blessed them with. Evidently, they had a habit of using their home for the church to meet. And on at least one occasion, the Apostle Paul lived with them. And Morris says that some codices in 1 Corinthians 16, 19 say that Paul is saying there in that letter that he's living with them at Corinth and at Rome. They opened up their home. It is a, a Christian, I hate to even say it this way, I'm going to say it this way and then I'll qualify. It. It's a Christian responsibility for us to be hospitable. I have, not here at Lehman, but I have been in, in situations where I've heard elders criticized for not being hospitable. 
they'll say, you know, and they'll say it'll be said something like this. I've never been in so-and-so's home, which, which can be a fair criticism. I get that. But do you realize that for that one passage that speaks of elders, that there are three passages that say that all Christians are to practice hospitality? Romans 12, 3, Hebrews 13, 2, and 1 Peter 4, 9. And of course, as we know, all it has to say it is one time for it to be truth. So it's responsibility that we have to one another to open up our homes, to open up our lives. But as it is with just about every command of the Bible, there's a profound blessing that comes in obeying the Lord in those regards. Not being mindful of what you think you do or don't have in the home that you have. When you open up your home, what happens is, is that you get to know and be known in a way that we just can't be known here at the church building. And also through that, you, you find that there's a bond that grows between you and your spouse. Because if you're doing it right, there's probably two of you preparing for it. There are two of you actively involved in it. And then there are two of you who are cleaning up after it's all done. And as you, you talk about the, the things that have happened in that evening, you're growing closer together as a couple, even as you're growing closer to other brothers and sisters in Christ. But Aquila and Priscilla were hospitable, and they were together in that. And then they were together in their service. The fact that Paul took them on two missionary journeys, and they stayed in Ephesus to help him to set up the ministry there, shows that they were servants. In my experience, it seems that there's no shortage of people who want to lead, who want to be the chief. But very little work gets done when there's all generals and no foot soldiers. To be a success as a Christian as husband and wives being, being, being willing to say, I will serve. I will knock doors if that's what's just decided. I will participate in work days. I will turn off the lights and lock the building. I will provide transportation to somebody who's in need. I will participate in benevolent works. And I can think of couples right now uh, already here at, at Lehman who are synonymous with service. They cause thoughts of greatness, dignity, and honor. Even though they're maybe not even the ones out front who are the most visible and the most vocal. And Jesus said it was going to be that way. In Matthew 20, 25 to 28, he says, Out in the world, the princes of the Gentiles and those who are in authority in the world, they exercise dominion and power over others. But it shall not be so with you. Whoever is going to be first, let him be your servant. Whoever will be chief among you, let him be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. I love what Oxenham says. He says, is your place a small place? Tend it with care. He puts you there. Is your place a large place? Guard it with care. He sets you there. Whatever your place, it's not yours alone, but his who set you there. The foundation of marriage must be proper, and only Christ will do and the men of the Pauline circle, a man by the name of Seeking, said, Neither Paul or Luke ever thinks of these apart from the other. Their names are as truly wedded as their lives are. Don't you want to build a marriage such that when people think of you, they think of you in tandem? They think of you and your spouse? How beautiful that is. Being faithful Christians and fellow workers is not going to save a marriage by itself. But it could have saved a lot of marriages that failed, and it could improve a lot of marriages that are struggling. So if we want to build up our marriage, there's no better thing that we can do than to be heaven-hearted and to do it together, realizing that we're not going to make it to heaven alone. And as we have influence over anybody, the one we have the most influence on is the one that we said, I do too. Let's make that sweeter and sweeter each and every day. Thank <laughs> you.